Welcome to part four of the Bone Graphic Novels. We're slaying dragons today, and based off the book cover, Phony's scheming to be a scumbag. Again, probably has something to do with dragons somehow. And Phonebone is like, okay, relax with the endless lying and manipulation, Phony. It's getting a little old. Lucius agrees. You got the big guy reconsidering his whole life over there. And you can basically get the whole synopsis of the plot basically from just the cover. So good stuff. But this frame is only partially close to a real frame, so this brings the total down to one for four. The Great Cow Race remains alone so far. But semantics. After Eyes of the Storm, this one unites the two main plot lines to give Phony the spotlight. This is his book, and I'll get into the details at some point, but let's start at the beginning where instead of chapter one, there's a prologue. Oh, fuck, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. First off, Lucius is paying for the guy with the hood's meal out of his own pocket in the middle of the bet with Phony, clearly showing this pilgrim a lot of respect that Wendell, a mix of an Easter Island head and a Minecraft villager, doesn't show any respect for, and decides that he'll buy from Phony, who doesn't serve stick eaters. Even though he doesn't care, Phony would let a homeless dude sell him his last crack pipe to win this bet. Chapter 1 starts, for two days Gramaven has been avoiding the road at all costs while traveling to Barrelhaven, and we get the first two-page wide frame of the series and I can't help but notice this weird looking mountain from this perspective. It makes it look like it's like a half pipe. At the tavern, Phony's Dragon Slayer campaign is working wonders. Nobody's buying from Lucius, but Smiley's going around making bread and those stale bread thingies. You know how butterbeer was a thing in Harry Potter and now you can get it at Universal in real life? I need a fan-made recipe for the hard, stale, stuffed bread thingies. Lucius is still trying to dissuade everyone, saying dragons are make-believe in children's stories, but Phony's lies have convinced this fruity-ass idiot dragons are the problem. Look, look at how he is sitting. Even Jonathan Oakes, an employee of Lucius, buys from Phony and if you wanted to know how dumb the townspeople really are, Jonathan Oak's lines throughout are evidence enough that anyone could walk into the barrel haven and walk out at least one egg richer. Lucius brings Phony into the pantry and wants to call off the bet. He doesn't like how he's lying to the farmers about dragons causing all their problems. And Phony responds with, the profits the bet is bringing the tavern, which Lucius doesn't want since it ain't honest. He also points out how Lucius isn't being honest with the people either by saying that dragons aren't real. And Phony's telling, quote, the truth by saying dragons are real, even though his truth is painting them as the cause of everything bad in the world. This puts poor Lucius in a precarious situation, either maintain the position of lying about the existence of dragons, continuing said lie because the dragons didn't want people to know they existed, and respected their wishes since he fought with them back in the war against the rat creatures. Or admit that dragons are real and that he lied for years to protect the dragon's wishes and the people, then accuse Phony of lying about dragons being bad to win the bet between them and gain control of the townspeople. Grandma Ben is still making her way to the barrel haven when she's nerfed by the gitchy feeling, and the two abominable rat creatures show up once again trying to stuff foam bone in a quiche. And for some reason, they're not afraid of Grandma Ben, even though she defended herself against an army of rat creatures by herself. Surely they would have heard that through the grapevine somehow. She scares them, like, 20 feet away, and the gitchy feeling fades away, but when Thorn touches her sword and the rat creatures don't like that, again, throwing around the T word, she gets suspicious because the forest should be full of rat creatures, but she can't hear any. So she does a CNN exclusive interview with this rat creature, who tells her they've been ordered to evacuate the valley and they betrayed their orders. But he's interrupted by King Doc, officially in version 2, since this big guy doesn't look the same as how he looked in the first book, he's massive now for some reason. The giant teeth in War Club weren't scary enough, and tosses these two aside before deciding the best way to defeat Grandma Ben is the same strategy, and Phonebone looks at the open gash on his head and calls out to the dragon for help. At the tavern, Phony realizes business is slowing down, and Smiley tells him about the Midsummer's Day picnic that the people are saving up for, and Phony doesn't like the people holding out on him. Then Smiley hears Phonebone calling out for the dragon, and they get a search party together to fan out and search for Thorn, Grandma Ben, and Phonebone. Grandma Ben's in the middle of getting her shit rocked when Thorn comes along and cuts off King Doc's club holding arm, causing him to hallucinate them both as princesses before showing them he could swallow both of them whole with one bite, then just walks away in version 3, by the way. He passes out from blood loss while the two cowardly rat creatures realize that King Doc is the only one who knows they betrayed their orders, and they just leave him there and decide to hide away forever. Before the search party finds them, Grandma Ben has to spark notes Thorn's destiny to her. Thorn is the crowned princess of Athea, just like Grandma Ben was once, yada yada, we already knew all that. But Thorn isn't a normal princess. She's something called a Veni Yankari. 
she can see into both the real world and the spirit world, where an evil spirit called the Lord of the Locust will try to use her powers to make himself a physical body and try to end the world. The Hooded One is called the Hooded One because it's a tradition of a religious group called the Venu, who guarded Athea in the old days and studied dreams in the spirit world, and wore their hoods just like the Hooded One does, who serves the Lord of the Locust and wants to use either Thorn or Phony in a ritual to give the Locust freedom and give him a physical body in the real world. Again, Thorn accepts this as the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and reacts in the best way po- Oh. Well. This here is a little forced. Grandma Ben wants Phonebone to do something. Thorn doesn't know what she's doing, and Phonebone pretty uncharacteristically goes, And you do? Drama. She gives Phonebone the sword and this necklace, and tells him to go to Lucius and tell him about what she told Thorn. Then they go their separate ways. Phonebone catches up to Thorn and they reach the barrel haven that's been blocked off by a gate and they can't be let in, according to Jonathan Oak's new boss. And we missed another fear-mongering session by Phony, who now has dictator level of control over the people. Speaking of the Hooded One, they're in the middle of talking to what we can assume now is the Lord of the Locust itself. And they talk about attacking Barrel Haven and trying to get Thorn to turn to the dark side. Then the Hooded One gets a little depth to them. They ask why they need Thorn in the first place. Are they not good enough? And the Locust basically just goes, don't, don't worry about it. You're my, you're my special little guy. You're my, you're my special little person. At Barrel Haven, Thorn and Phonebone return from looking for Lucius and Grandma Ben all night. And Thorn goes to sleep while Phonebone has dinner with Phony and Smiley. And they explain how the townspeople are paying Phony to protect them from dragons and they took over Lucius's bar. We're so deep in this now, I think it's important to summarize. The Bones are here because Phony got them chased out of Boneville. They wandered their way into the valley and have gotten so immersed in the chaos that they've sort of caused... That when Phony brings up how the plan is now to leave the valley with the treasures the people have given them, Phonebone says, count me out, I'm staying here. Phony assumes it's about his crush on Thorn, but Phonebone says it's about how the rat creatures are after Phony, who obviously doesn't care about the well-being or the lives of the people of the valley, and Phonebone slams the door on him for being a dick. He leaves and is aggressively assaulted by a baby rat creature, like how a cat assaults the corner of a couch. Meanwhile, Thorn's sleeping and having another nightmare, which is the Lord of the Locust trying to turn her evil. The princess versions of Grandma Ben and Thorn are on the cliff by the cave where the Lord of the Locust is. And the Hooded One tries to get Thorn to take their hand again, and almost succeeds, but Phonebone's ghost appears in the sky to wake her up. He woke her up because he doesn't know what to do with the woke baby whack creature, and Thorn knows exactly what to do. I'll kill it like it killed my parents, and holy shit, relax, Thorn! Lucius comes back from searching alone and is immediately confused and reports that he didn't find Grandma Ben. And by God, if that isn't the saddest face I've ever seen, God, I just want to see him happy. I just want to see the smile from behind his little mustache. I think I have a crush. Phony rocks up, telling Lucius how things have changed in like the 36 hours he was gone, and Lucius almost goes gorilla mode when he finds out Phony took over his bar, but is stopped by pitchforks held to his throat by his own friends who say they want Phony to have control now. Phonebone is showing Smiley the cub he hid in the barn, and here is the conclusive evidence that rat creatures are barely a threat. Because the cub chomps on Smiley's arm with these sharp-ass teeth and doesn't even leave a mark. Same thing with this frame from out from Boneville. He's legit gnawing on Grandma Ben's forehead and she lives. But that might be because she's indestructible or something like that, but Smiley isn't. And he can still just tank a bite from those teeth that must be made of marshmallows or something. They hide the cub as they hear Lucius coming, and Phonebone tells him what Grandma Ben told him to tell him. The rat creatures have activated the valley. How she told Thorn she's a fairy princess, which is news to Smiley, about the Venu and the dreaming and the spirit world and all that stuff. They go to check on Thorn, kind of treating her like she's going to flip out again. Instead, she just breaks down, and, God, Lucius is just the best guy ever. I think I have a crush. While that incredibly melancholy scene is going on, at the same time, the Hooded One is inciting a riot for his satanic master and decrees that the valley belongs to the Lord of the Locust, and anyone that stands in their way will be killed by the rat creature's pillow-like teeth. The next day, Phony and Wendell are going around the camp, and Phony accuses him of hoarding resources from him. Wendell wants him to actually go out and do his dragon slaying job, but Phony calls him out about the Midsummer's Day picnic, which means so much to the children, which we'd never see a single one beyond, like, this baby. Phony orders them to gather up all the stuff they've been keeping from him in the center of town, then puts on his Shakespearean hat to collect taxes from Lucius, who's been relegated to barrel maker and hat insulter. Also, what kind of hammer makes a walk sound? 
Phone bone and Smiley give the Cubs some food while talking about abandoning it in the mountains. And it understands English, so that's traumatic, like at the minimum. Thorne walks in and Smiley hides the Cub while she tells Phone Bone she can't sleep because she's afraid of her nightmares so much and is so tired that being awake feels like a dream, which sounds like me on the day an upload is due, and that she's going back to the farmhouse. Obviously, Phonebone calls out that not only is she the heir to the throne of Athea, the farmhouse isn't safe anymore, and she's sleep deprived and not making a good decision, and the hero officially rejects the call to action by throwing down Grima Ben's sword and taking off into the crowd, forming around Phony, who gives a speech on the greed and secrecy of the Midsummer's Day picnic. Lucius starts to lose his shit a little bit once Phony starts spouting off, saying that this type of behavior is what attracts dragons who are a cowardly and greedy species, and Lucius has to be restrained from throttling Phony's little neck before finally admitting in front of everybody that dragons are real. Then Phony asks him why he told everyone dragons were fake, and he says, nothing, letting Phony get away with it instead of replying by saying, I fought side by side with dragons, they're like brothers to me, and before they went back into the mountains after we won a war together, they told me their one wish they wanted, and that was to tell everybody that they didn't exist, and I respected that wish. And then, this puny, manipulative, unbelievably greedy, narcissistic, self-serving, self-absorbed, self-righteous, piece-of-shit scumbag who takes advantage of everybody around him, including his own cousins, who are more like his brothers, and he thinks everybody around him is dirt and thinks himself as a god even though he's nothing more than a gloating, fast-talking pipsqueak who will never learn to do even the bare minimum to be a good person and only exists to profit off the good nature of people by betraying their trust and deserves to have those closest to him finally realize he's irredeemably shitty to everybody he meets and abandon him like the filthy mangy animal he is. Hallelujah! Holy shit! Where's the Tylenol? He came along and took advantage of the people I love by turning them against me, even though I was just trying to protect them. That's what I think of Phony as a character. He's entertaining and progresses the story, but his story is him coming to the valley and continuously trying to scam the people is so pointless because he doesn't learn his lesson at all, ever. Throughout the whole series, he enters the valley a bad person, acts like a bad person the whole time, and leaves the valley an unchanged bad person. But I understand his valley to the story is someone to hate. I just wish that at some point he'd learn his lesson, but what he does to those around him is so much worse than the consequences he gets, and we never feel like anything bad ever happens to him because he doesn't care what others think about him. This doesn't matter because he'll still be a piece of shit no matter everyone else's opinion of him, and he always thinks what he does is right, and everyone else is the problem. So the audience never feels like there's any weight to the consequences of his actions, because he's a psychopath who only cares about himself, and we never see him truly care about his cousins because there's never a situation in the series where Phony has to sacrifice something for either phone bone or smiley and so them caring about him makes no sense because a time where phony has to show that he cares more about his cousins than material possessions never happens so i think at least one of two things should have happened to phony during this series either phone bone should have realized that phony will never change his scheming ways and cut him out after a certain point or phony actually undergoes some change to his character where he realizes people are worth more than money but this never fucking happens, and it's so frustrating throughout the entire series to watch Phony constantly do terrible things and never see serious consequences, and that's my TED Talk. I'll get back to the story now. I really like the speech bubble variety of how the line is delivered. Like, the hooded one has a whispery, maybe raspy voice because of the smaller font and wavy bubble lines. And this line from Phony is, like, dark and gloomy. Like, Alan Rickman as Snape would have this kind of speech bubble. Smiley goes up to a disheveled Lucius and asks him again why he lied about the dragons, and his response confused me. At first, he said, We're always taught that dragons don't exist. It's the only way we can discover them for ourselves. Unfortunately, not everyone does. I couldn't parse through this answer. What I gather from Lucius's response here isn't a real answer. It's not an answer based on his own personal experience or the history of the valley. It's an answer based on vibes. He likes the vibes that the mystery behind the dragons brought, and I like that even though we know from the get-go that dragons are real, the mystery behind why everyone thinks dragons aren't real draws the audience in. I want to see the real reason behind the lie, and we're almost there. I would also like to take back what I said in The Great Cow Race about Smiley being more serious now because he doesn't smile or smoke cigars as much. I was very wrong. He's talking about things spiraling out of control while smoking cigars throughout the book.
That night, the Hooded One is sending out their armies when they tell King Doc to go and bring them Thorn and the Bones. But King Doc thinks they're not worth it and wants to fight the dragon. But the Hooded One says, You do what you're told, you big one-armed bitch. This war is more than just taking land. I need to do an Aztec sacrifice with Phony for God knows what reason. Phonebone and Smiley wait as long as possible for Thorn until they decide she must not want to come free the cub with them, so they prison escape the Barrel Haven and they take off for the mountains. Phony's in the middle of looking for his cousins when Ted jumps in and Phony describes his whole plan to him. He'll leave Barrel Haven with a wagon full of treasure in the morning and travel the whole day to the Dragon Stair, where he'll have the townspeople set up a trap to catch a dragon, because it's the Dragon Stair, there's bound to be one. And while they're doing that, he'll say he's making a trail of treasure leading back to the fake trap, but he'll actually slip into the darkness and leave the valley to go back to Boneville with a huge sum of gold. Ted promises to look for Phone Bone so that he can escape with Phony before calling him out, which Phony should have taken as a fucking warning. We see Thorn for the first time in a little bit. She's super tired and passes out in the middle of the woods and is surrounded by these hooded Venu dudes who surround her and do something. This whooshing that they do helps form this dream maybe because Thorn has another nightmare and she's freaking out as she's surrounded by stick figures making the same noise before her environment changes to the cave the dragons kept her in. And out of frame, the great red dragon shows her rat creatures and then putting her friends in danger. And the lesson is, you can't run away from your problems. And Thorn goes from little kid to current Thorn to princess Thorn throughout the dream. And remember that T word I've been talking about, the turning? Well, look at the chapter title. That's what this dream is. Her turning from someone afraid and resistant to their destiny to someone who's accepted it and is awakened to it. And just like in the dream where Thorn changes from her younger self to her royal self, Thorne's character also drastically changes after this specific dream, which we'll see later, but I feel like I didn't understand the importance of this scene while reading it. So, for the adaptation, I'd like the climax of the score during this scene, please. That morning, Phony and the townspeople take off from Barrelhaven, rubbing it in Lucia's face just a little more before they leave him alone in town, and we time skip to that night at the Dragon's Stair where Phony tells the people to set up the trap while he's taking the treasure to make a trail that'll lead into the trap. And he starts to leave before Ted shows up again, and Phony says he's leaving without his cousins because it's their fault that they didn't show up in time. So Ted arranged for the fake trap Phony set up to actually work. The dragon and Ted literally just mess with Phony by making his plan actually work up until the point where the people are tired of waiting for Phony to take action, and they tie the dragon's mouth shut and tell him to kill it now or it's his head too. And he's about to do it until Thorn, fresh off a life-changing dream, shows up and wants to know, what is going on here? She easily comes to the same realization the people do. Phony's done them in again, and it's real this time, because they see fire coming from Barrelhaven, and everyone thinks it's the dragon still. And Thorn does a shitty job explaining how it's actually the rat creatures attacking, and they almost swarm her trying to get to the dragon before the rat creatures actually show up. Then the hooded Venu guys save them, and Phony grabs the sword from Thorn and saves his own neck, along with everyone else's, by freeing the dragon who scares off the rats by breathing fire everywhere and chasing after them leaving Thorn and the people to figure out how fucked they really are. Thorn and Phony don't know where Phonebone, Smiley, or Grandma Ben are, and the Barrel Haven's on fire and Lucius was the only one there, and all the townspeople aren't there to defend their homes that may be getting destroyed at this very moment because they got duped by Phony again. Yes, Wendell, what have you done? And that's the Dragon Slayer. That took way longer than I thought it would, but I guess I had to put that rant about Phony in there somewhere. There's also a lot of confusion behind the mystery of the existence of dragons between Lucius and the people of Barrelhaven that I could have gotten into but didn't. I don't think it's important enough to have another ramble in this video that was dialogue-y enough, if I'm being honest. Looking back, I sometimes wish I didn't take this thing so seriously. It's just a little comic book series from 2009, and the main characters are the doodles of a five-year-old. Next week is the weird one. I'll see you then, okay? Peace.